now what is the meaning of parkinson disease see there parkinson disease is also known as idiopathic parkinson's disease because this is a idiopathic condition usually share okay so let me go a bit slowly idiopathic parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder associated with a loss of dopaminergic nigrostriatal neuron wonderful definition everything is there in this definition so this is usually a idiopathic condition in this there is a progressive death of the neuron neurodegeneration means death of the neuron they are dying they are disappearing the number is decreasing where in the nigro striatal system or substantia nigra and where is this substantia nigra present in the brain which area mid brain mid brain mid brain mid brain very good very good it's a part of the mid brain excellent it's a part of the mid brain and there is a substantia nigra the substantia nigra is very rich in dopaminergic neuron so those neurons are dying or disappearing in case of parkinson disease so this is not a case of okay uh, it is not a similar type of case like demyelinating disease remember that in that condition only the myelin sheath is affected the nerve is intact but here the whole nerve is dying or disappearing so this is called neurodegenerative disorder this disease is named after james parkinson the english physician who described this parkinson disease as the shaking palsy in 1817 long long time ago james parkinson described this disease for the first time and that time he, he described it as a shaking palsy Okay, that's why the disease is named after him. Now, see there, all of you. This is one of the most common neurological disorders in clinical practice, which affect approximately one percent of the individual older than sixty years. Now, usually, it affects the older people. in older people usually there is death or degeneration of our neurons inside the central nervous system so this can also happen many of the doctor you have seen this in different television serials or probably some of the movies also when they the surgeons you know when they become a bit older though they are excellent surgeon they still have that skill the surgical skill you know once they have uh, this uh, parkinson disease they should quit their job they are not fit for that job anymore though they have a lot of experience you know they can do a lot of mistake while operating on the patient because it it gives rise to few of the cardinal features a symptom and they are resting tremor rigidity bradykinesia and postural instability so let let us uh, explain this okay one after other so what do you mean by tremor what is tremor now tremor is the abnormal movement it's a type of abnormal movement there is a, a rhythmic type of oscillation in the extremity okay this is a tremor these tremor are roughly divided into two type intentional tremor and resting tremor now intentional tremor means when you are about to do something for example you are about to write something you are you have already uh, you know caught the pain in between your finger and you are going to write during that time you suffer from tremor and you cannot write properly the handwriting you know doesn't look good at all this is intentional tremor and in which condition you see intentional tremor any answer where hyper hyperthyroidism and one more when and not in doing something work cerebellar disorders okay 
cerebellar diseases as well as hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis resting tremor sorry intentional tremor is quite common to see and some of the people okay they are suffering from essential tremor we don't have any etiology or reason for that idiopathic condition usually it runs in the family they usually have tremor most of the time this is known as uh, you know essential tremor and even with extensive investigation we don't know what is the cause so tremors can be of different type but here we are talking about parkinson disease so this is a resting tremor the patient is not doing anything but still there is tremor going on rest of the thing okay we'll discuss a, a little while later let me just explain the meaning now rigidity now rigidity is what is rigidity i want to hear some answer here what is rigidity hypertonia right. your tone will be increased sir it's a uh, good uh, it's extra extra pyramidal lesion sir here occur no decrease in resistance sir throughout resistance occur in rigidity okay good that is also very well accepted answer excellent okay so let me clarify this rigidity means increased tone very good the tone is excessive here but this increased tone is from the lesion of extra pyramidal system in this case a pyramidal system is affected and tone is increased we use the term spasticity okay now let me write that term for you so this is very important clinical knowledge that is a common question which is asked in the exam the difference between spasticity spasticity okay city and rigidity and rigidity okay okay rigidity now spasticity is usually seen in pyramidal tract lesion or upper motor neuron lesion you can say and this has a important hallmark when you are going to examine that patient for example the elbow lesion in case of spasticity the the tone is very increased there is no doubt so if you slowly wants to you know bend that elbow for a certain moment okay you feel resistance and after you reach uh, to a particular level it suddenly give away okay it suddenly give away like you are you know closing that knife this is called clasp knife type of spasticity clasp knife okay whereas rigidity is increase resistance throughout you don't feel any easiness after a certain moment it is rigid throughout so this is called rigidity so never forget these two uh, you know important points bradykinesia bradykinesia means the person has decreased movement the person hesitate to move now look at this picture here this old fella okay is slightly stooping okay slightly bent forward and he is walking very slowly it looks like he is scanning something on the floor okay he he cannot take the faster pace at all this is known as bradykinesia and postural instability is a problem in the posture the top 3 are much more important feature than the last one the last one may not be present in all the patient but resting tremor rigidity and bradykinesia are very very important feature now now you want to know exactly where is that substantia nigra because this disease is all about problem in substantia nigra so please focus on the slide now and try to remember this picture
you see here so this is the uh, midbrain okay this is the area where we have taken cross section this is the midbrain this is anterior part of the midbrain here is the posterior part now uh, midbrain is roughly divided into two main parts first anteriorly we call that cerebral peduncle posteriorly we call that tectum so cerebral peduncle you can clearly see here this area is called cerebral peduncle and posteriorly we have tectum okay in the in the you know uh, uh, another way even easier than you at the middle part see this of the midbrain there is aqueduct of sylvius or cerebral aqueduct so the part of the midbrain which lies posterior to the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius is the tectum and the part which is lying anterior to the cerebral aqueduct means all these areas is the cerebral peduncle now what are the important structure present in the tectum these are called colliculi superior and inferior colliculi now see this superior colliculi is shown here okay and probably at this uh, you know cross sectional area the inferior colliculi is not present okay we need to cut a little bit inferior to that whereas uh, cerebral peduncle is this whole area now cerebral peduncle is again divided into three important region cross cerebri substantia nigra and tegmentum this the anterior most part is the cross cerebri where the corticospinal fibers are present what is the origin of corticospinal fiber from where they come from the cortex cortex cerebral cortex, cortex. 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 exactly cerebrum or cerebral cortex okay it has got different layers the cerebral cortex are different layers and they mainly originate from the layer fifth or fifth layer of the cerebral cortex okay let's not go into the detail now and they gradually descend downward after midbrain there is to the pons and there is to the medulla in the pyramid of the medulla majority of those corticospinal fiber they cross and go to the opposite side now this is the substantia nigra which we are talking about see this this is a pigmented area it has got pigmentation and these are mainly consist of dopaminergic neuron the neurotransmitter is dopamine here and parkinson disease is all about decrease amount of dopamine or damage or death of this dopaminergic neuron the third important part cerebral peduncle is tegmentum this is tegmental area this area and red nucleus is present here red nucleus red nucleus is a member of extra pyramidal system okay now you can see one important structure here known as medial lemniscus can anybody tell me what is medial lemniscus yes sir this medial lemniscus is more and lower okay one after other yes yes sadam you 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 complete first then i'll ask the question to ujair yes start from the lower limb on the sensation coming to your um gracilus and from the upper limb the the sensation comes from the uh the sicilus in your case so when they come to the uh, midbrain they will come into the medial lemniscus system very good very good excellent answer yes ujair is the you want to say the same thing sir the sensation from the lower limb and upper limb through the cuneatus and the gracilis fiber move upward to the uh, medulla so there are two nucleus nucleus gracilis and the uh, cuneatus uh, so, so from there there will be a uh, tissuation into internal arcuate fibers and they will move upward to the uh, thalamus in, uh, as a medial lemniscus fine very good answer so very good you have to keep on revising your neurology okay very impressed now let me explain this for the sake of other students who are listening here 
medial lemniscus means the fiber which are coming out from those two nuclei okay nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus okay now after the fiber are coming out from there means the fiber are still going upwards they cross over and ascend to the opposite side these tracks are known as medial lemniscus so in one sentence you can say they are carrying the same fiber okay of dorsal column tract of the spinal cord the similar type of sensation are carried by them medial lemniscus now one question i want to ask before i move further what is the function of superior and inferior colliculi yes who can answer this sir sir superior colliculi is connected with eyes and inferior colliculi is attached to the third and fourth cranial nerve okay wait wait let me let me let me choose the students and ask okay otherwise it's very haphazard i cannot hear anything yes rana atisham you are saying something Okay, you go on. Sir, uh, superior collicula is uh, connected with eyes and uh, inferior collicula with ears. Exactly. Okay. Right. So I'm sure many of the students are also saying the same thing. They are absolutely correct. The superior collicula is a part of visual pathway, visual pathway, and inferior collicula is a part of auditory pathway or hearing. hearing pathway now let's talk about what is the etiology of parkinson's disease now we already talked about it is a idiopathic condition usually you know we don't know what is the or what are the causes but we believe certain factors may be responsible so you can tell these are the hypotheses there like certain genetic and certain environmental factors now regarding the environmental factors some of the important factors are highlighted here see this okay pesticide and exposure to herbicide living in a rural environment and consumption of well water these are just a hypothesis or or assumption these may be associated with increased incidence of parkinson disease probably these are the you know uh, causes which damage the substantia nigra and the dopaminergic neuron which are present there now can you give me some of the example of pesticide anybody which are pesticides any name you know maybe from the forensic medicine melathion 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 very good melathion paracetamol okay tiosulfate exactly and ddt 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 malathion parathion these are called insecticide or pesticide and farmers are mainly affected by these you know pesticides or insecticides exposure so they are probably at high risk for the development of parkinson disease and similarly okay most of the farmers they live in the rural environment or uh, towards the village side or remote areas and probably they also consume the well water there we really do not know you know what is the relation of well water with this uh, development of parkinson disease but few of the cases have been reported let's move on now there is one very toxic substance which is associated with the development of parkinson disease and that toxic substance is known as mptp okay mptp and this is the full form methyl phenyl tetrahydropyridine methyl phenyl tetrahydropyridine see here So this can be asked as a MCQ question in the different exam. Okay, please try to remember this. Now, what is the point in favor of this toxic substance? Why this is associated with the etiology of Parkinson's disease? Now, if somebody, you know, self-injected this substance into them, then those particular people may develop bradykinesia, 
rigidity and tremor it's a resting tremor all of these look similar to the parkinson disease and then these classical clinical feature will improve after we give dopamine so that's why this toxic substance may be responsible for the causation of parkinson disease so this is the connection you know this mptp cross the blood brain barrier and is oxidized to okay oxidized form of mptp which we call is mpp plus by the enzyme monoamine oxidase type b also known as mao type b okay in short form we call it mao type b because it is responsible for the metabolism of that particular substance now this mpp which is a quite toxic substance than mptp also it accumulates in the mitochondria of those dopaminergic neuron okay and they interfere with the function of respiratory chain respiratory chain okay also known as electron transport chain inside those dopaminergic neuron so the synthesis of dopamine is severely decreased or they may damage to those neuron as well and you may be wondering why people inject this particular substance isn't it that question must be coming in your mind because this is a toxic substance so what happens here this usually occurs in the drug addict people there are so many people who consume this illicit drug all over the world and this is a type or metabolite of a, you know illicit drug let's move on now another you know hypothesis regarding the etiology of parkinson disease is the oxidation hypothesis this oxidation hypothesis tells us the free radicals are responsible for the damage of dopaminergic neuron and these free radicals are liberated there okay because of dopamine's oxidative metabolism so this is just you know one of the hypothesis but it is not a clear cut one now another one the role of genetic factors okay the role of genetic factors and that uh, you know hypothesis is helped by the study in twins and these genetic factors appear to be very important when the disease begins at or before the age of 50 means younger people if they develop parkinson disease probably the genetic factors are responsible if one twin develops this particular condition the another twin may also develop it especially the monozygotic twins now with this hypothesis and the etiology let's talk about what is the pathophysiology of parkinson disease now what is the meaning here if dopaminergic neurons are damaged okay what is happening inside that particular area now listen carefully this is a very important concept because of decreased number of the dopaminergic neuron in the substantia nigra there is a clear cut imbalance between cholinergic neuron and the dopaminergic neuron now what do you mean by cholinergic neuron what is the meaning yes acetylcholine 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 their neurotransmitter is acetylcholine that's why they are known as cholinergic neuron the neurotransmitter which is involved there is acetylcholine and dopaminergic neuron means they they secret dopamine as their neurotransmitter a very simple meaning now what i'm saying here after this dopaminergic neurons are damaged or lost then cholinergic neuron will have the upper hand and cholinergic neurons are the stimulatory type of neurons dopaminergic neurons are relatively inhibitory type it may not be true all the time okay but this is the you know common thing you should remember approximately 60 to 80% of the dopaminergic neurons are lost before the motor signs of parkinson disease emerge means majority of the dopaminergic neuron should be damaged already then only the patient will have signs and symptoms and pathologically there is one very important term you should not forget that is levi body these levi bodies are the characteristic feature of parkinson disease 
and these Levi bodies are the pathological feature. Okay, if we take the biopsy from that particular area and send that to the histopathology lab, then they will report yes, there is presence of Levi body inside those neurons, and that can be considered as one of the very important diagnostic points. Now, what are these Levi bodies? Let's talk about them a little bit. So here, yeah, these Levi bodies are inclusion bodies. Now, inclusion bodies means these are actually the waste product. Okay, they are useless product, and they are ac accumulated inside the cell, and they are the product of some metabolism. So these are concentric type, eosinophilic and cytoplasmic inclusion body. So they are uh, collected inside the cytoplasm and they are eosinophilic. Eosinophilic means they stain pink. Remember the hematoxylin and eosin stain, okay? Eosin stain, the, the substance stains pink. So we know they are pinkish type of substance present inside the cytoplasm of those particular neurons. The main component of Levi body is another type of protein, which is known as alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein. Try to remember this important MCQ point here. The presence of Levi body with, within the pigmented neurons of substantia nigra is characteristic feature of Parkinson's disease, but it is not a pathognomonic feature. Now, pathognomonic feature means it's the hallmark of that disease. Probably, if we see Levi body, we can diagnose that condition, but it is not the pathognomonic feature here. Why? Because it may be present in some other condition as well. That's why it is not considered pathognomonic feature. Now, the question is, which is that other condition where Levi bodies may be found? And the answer is dementia with Levi body. This is a separate condition. The name itself is a dementia with Levi body. So that condition also have Levi body inside the brain. That's why it is not considered pathognomonic in case of Parkinson disease. But nevertheless, if this is seen, then we can suspect Parkinson disease in that particular patient strongly. Okay, this is not a you know a very weak type of suspicion. This is a strong suspicion. Now with this, let's enter into the clinical features. Please pay attention. If you, you know, pay proper attention here, right in the class, you can diagnose Parkinson's disease because investigation play a very minor role in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Remember, this is mainly a clinical diagnosis. Okay, so we, sh we should pay attention now. The patient may have tightness in the calf or shoulder region. It may start like that tightness in the calf or shoulder region. The first affected arm may not swing fully. This is important feature. Remember, when we are walking, unknowingly, we are swinging our arms. Okay? We are swinging our upper limbs. This is, you know, this automatically occurs. This is involuntary type of things. But in Parkinson's disease, the first affected arm may not swing fully when the person walk. And the foot on the same side may scrape the floor or may, the patient may drag that floor. The patient may not completely lift that foot from the floor. So this is very early features of Parkinson's disease. See this. Okay. Now another one is a decreased swallowing in that patient which may lead to excessive drooling of the saliva. First, the saliva may be collected inside the oral cavity, and if the person is not swallowing it, definitely the person will drool it from the corner of the mouth. Now, can you tell me, what is that another condition where there is drooling of saliva from corner of the mouth? Which is that condition? Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy. Exactly. Okay, you can say Bell's palsy or uh, lower motor neuron type of facial nerve palsy. It's the same thing, isn't it? Uh, not exactly same thing, 
but Bell's palsy is the most common type of lower motor neuron type of facial nerve palsy. So you can use those terms interchangeably. Good one. Let's move on. There may be symptoms of autonomic dysfunction like constipation, a problem in the sweating, and sexual dysfunction. These all are, you know, autonomic nervous system function. So when that autonomic nervous system is involved because of the involvement of the brain, then these may be affected. So the person may have constipation, that old person, okay? There may be sweating abnormality, you may not sweat properly, or there may be sexual dysfunction. So these are some other features. And sleep disturbances are also quite common. Sleep disturbances are known as insomnia. So already the older person is having, you know, sleep disturbance. Uh, on top of that, if, if they are having Parkinson's disease, they will have more incidence of insomnia. Now we are entering into the very important part of today's topic. Those are the clinical uh, features related to the physical finding or signs of Parkinson's disease. The three cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease are resting tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. And sometimes you can include the fourth one also. The fourth one is called postural instability. Okay, the top three are far more important than the fourth one. Now see here. Okay, so which are those? Resting tremor, rigidity and bradykinesia and the fourth one is the postural instability now of these cardinal feature two of the three are required to make the diagnosis now see this that's why i told you this is a clinical diagnosis we can easily examine for the resting tremor we can examine for rigidity and we can examine for bradykinesia as well so you don't need any investigation to make this diagnosis that's why this type of topics are really important, you know. So if you, if you pay attention, you can easily make the concept. Postural instability, also known as balance dysfunction, is the fourth cardinal sign, but it emerges quite late in the disease, usually after eight years or more. So the early, early, you know, uh, if the patient come early, then probably this finding may not be there. One. Now let's elaborate on each of these important physical findings. Resting tremor is the first one. Now this resting tremor okay, occurs at the rest. That's why it is called resting tremor. The usual frequency is three to five hertz. Hertz is the unit of uh, frequency measurement. See there, it's the hertz, isn't it? Three to five hertz. And classically, the tremor may appear as a pill rolling motion, pill rolling motion of the hand or a simple oscillation of the hand or even the arm. Hand is more common than the arm. Now look at this picture. This is called pill rolling motion, pill rolling motion. The patient may continuously doing this type of movement. And there may be a simple shaking or oscillation of the hand. And that time the person is not doing anything. That's why it is known as resting tremor. There are certain other conditions where intentional tremor occurs in the patient. Intentional means they, they want to do something. For example, they are about to write, you know, and then the tremor start. So can you tell me which are the causes of intentional tremor? Excellent. Very good. In the last class also, I remember we have discussed a little bit about this. Then don't forget these two important causes. Hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis is one of them. And another is cerebellar disorders. In those conditions, there will be intentional tremor. Okay, they are very important one. And sometimes there is a condition known as essential tremor. It runs in the family. You know, if a person is a bit nervous, the tremor starts and that tremor can be easily seen by other people as well. 
we have to do different investigation to rule out all these different causes which i've listed now but uh, in essential tremor all of the investigations are negative and we label them as a intentional tremor we we need a good counseling for the speech people okay so let's move on the another important cardinal feature is rigidity okay this is rigidity now look at the meaning of rigidity here rigidity refers to an increase in resistance to passive movement about a joint so it is resistance to move the limb increase in resistance to passive movement about a joint now every student know what is active movement and what is a passive movement active movement means patient himself or herself is moving the limbs around the joint that is active passive patient is not doing anything you are bending the elbow or bending that joint wherever you know everywhere all over the body that type of movement is called passive movement now what i am saying here when you do the passive movement about a joint or around a joint there is excessive resistance felt this is known as rigidity now we have to differentiate this rigidity from spasticity spasticity is seen in corticospinal tract lesion let me write that here spasticity it is seen in pyramidal lesion pyramidal tract lesion also known as corticospinal tract lesion and this is spasticity okay also known as clasp knife spasticity okay clasp knife spasticity now what is the meaning this limb is also having excessive tone both of these conditions are example of hypertonia but when we uh, apply a certain you know power or force to bend that arm or bend that joint for a certain moment there is a resistance felt and after we reach a particular point there is sudden loss of the resistance okay and it suddenly give away this is known as clasp knife type of spasticity never forget this this is a classical features of upper motor neuron lesion or pyramidal tract lesion whereas in this type of condition this is an example of extra pyramidal lesion okay extra pyramidal lesion there is resistance throughout the passive movement there is it doesn't give away after a particular point so some other terms are also used okay for the explanation of this particular type of rigidity and they are known as lead pipe rigidity or cog wheel rigidity lead pipe or cog wheel they are rigid throughout cog lead pipe rigidity is a smooth type of resistance and cog wheel is a oscillating type of resistance but there is resistance throughout and these are the features of hypertonia one of the very easy way to examine for this uh, you know rigidity is see by flexing and extending the patient's relaxed wrist we ask the patient to completely relax and we rhythmically flex and extend the wrist or you can also do that in the elbow area and you can easily find out how much rigid is the limb now the third important type of cardinal feature is bradykinesia okay bradykinesia now brady means slow kinesia is a movement the the meaning is right there brady is slow kinesia is the movement so what is the meaning here there is a slow type of movement in the patient slowness of the movement it also include a lack of spontaneous movement and decrease amplitude of the movement now, what do you mean by that when the person is about to walk the person hesitate to walk the person takes time okay to move the foot and the amount of movement is also less so this is a very important feature of bradykinesia think about this particular you know condition 
sometimes when you go outside you know in a in a city or in a downtown or in any other area if you pay attention to some of the older individuals you know they are relatively a little bit slightly bend their back they constantly looking at the floor before they walk this is a typical features of bradykinesia and probably they are suffering from parkinson disease now bradykinesia is also expressed as okay it has a different manifestation like micrographia means small handwriting than before okay micrographia before the parkinson disease uh, you know starts the person's handwriting was quite well normal now it has become smaller hypomimia is a decreased facial expression we call it blank face blank face the person uh, doesn't change the facial expression according to the situation third is a decreased blinking rate this is a important examination we do in a parkinson disease patient now how we check it just tap okay in the middle part in the middle part of the forehead in between the eye just tap there a normal person will blink when you do that in a parkinson disease patient there is a decreased chance of blinking and then the person will also have very soft type of speech or slow type of speech also known as hypophonia so these all are different manifestations of bradykinesia patient may start or experience freezing freezing this means hesitation to walk this is known as start hesitation they hesitate to turn also or they hesitate while crossing a threshold such as going through a doorway if there is no obstacle on the floor probably they can smoothly walk but whenever certain obstacle comes they stop there for a moment you know they think again and they slowly go further so this is uh, known as bradykinesia so don't forget with this you know type of description if you see this type of movement in a patient you know you think about uh, maybe this patient is having parkinson disease so this is a very very important finding now let's move further the another uh, physical finding which may be present in the patient is dementia dementia means loss of memory this parkinson disease is considered as a neurodegenerative disorder so uh, the most important part affected is substantia nigra there is no doubt about it but at the same time certain other areas of the brain can also be affected that's why dementia is the result and this dementia generally occurs late in parkinson disease and it affects almost 15 to 13% of the patient so 15 to 30% so it's a big percentage isn't it here okay now what happens there is a short term memory loss usually short term memory loss and there is visio spatial function which may be impaired but aphasia is not present so let me explain these are some of the new terms for you so let me elaborate on them short term memory loss can be diagnosed easily by asking some questions uh, which which uh, Uh, are a questions really related related to the event which occurs very recently one of the good question we can ask is what breakfast you eat in the morning time what food you eat uh, yesterday or day before yesterday now we don't forget that easily isn't it this is a very you know short uh, type of you know memory but this type of people they lose okay uh, this type of memory so it is known as short term memory loss another is called visio spatial function that is the depth of perception in the space depth of perception in the space for example we are watching you know uh, on the space now there is a certain you know movement a certain you know substance there our mind should be able to find out how far is that substance or what type of movement is happening all all three dimensional view or three dimensional picture should be there in our mind 
when we look at those particular objects in the space. But the people who are having Parkinson disease, they will have impairment of this type of function. Okay, so this is the meaning of impairment of visuospatial function. Probably the uh, frontal lobe of the brain is affected in this condition. Now, with this discussion, okay, let's talk about what are the differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism. Now, till now, I was talking about Parkinson disease. Now we have, a, a, you know, a seen a new term, Parkinsonism. So, what's the meaning here? Parkinsonism is a condition where features of Parkinson disease are seen. Please try to understand the difference here. Parkinson disease is an idiopathic condition where there are features of Parkinsonism like rigidity, bradykinesia, and tremor. It's an idiopathic situation. But Parkinsonism may be present in some other condition uh, apart from Parkinson's disease. So if you if you remember like that, okay, the concept is quite clear there. So the differential diagnosis may be idiopathic Parkinson disease. That's what our topic is all about today. Alzheimer disease because of dementia. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is other condition. I, I'll talk about this, okay? Uh, after after the break, probably. Cardioembolic stroke. This is multiple emboli, which is reaching to the brain from the heart. Essential tremor, probably because of tremor. This is considered as a differential diagnosis now. Jacob Kruzfeld or Kruzfeld Jacob disease, both are the correct term, and other prion disease. These are called transmissible spongiform diseases of the brain. They are the spongiform disease of the brain. They are caused by an infectious protein known as prion. And then certain drug, if this drug block the dopamine receptor or if they decrease the amount of dopamine in the central nervous system by causing excessive concentration of the acetylcholine or cholinergic receptors there, they may simply cause Parkinsonism like feature. Okay, so we call them drugs which cause Parkinsonism like feature. And some of the important examples are neuroleptics, antiemetics, okay, and some of the drugs which deplete do dopamine known as reserpine. So we'll talk about them after the break. So we are talking about the differential diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. The condition of rigidity, bradykinesia, and tremor is known as Parkinsonism. So there are a different condition uh, which uh, are considered as a differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism because of these different features like idiopathic Parkinson's disease. The classical features are present there. All, all cardinal features are present in this condition. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia all over the world. If somebody asks you, what is the number one cause of dementia in older population? The answer is Alzheimer's disease. This is also a type of neurodegenerative disorder. Normal pressure hydrocephalus means, okay, just analyze the term there. The answer would be right there. In this condition, when you measure the pressure, Okay, uh, while doing the lumbar puncture, the shear shear pressure, that is normal. On the other hand, there is development of hydrocephalus. So if this hydrocephalus is not caused by any blockage of the shear shear flow or not caused by any blockage at the shear shear absorption site. This hydrocephalus is caused by atrophy of the brain. Now think about it, if the overlying cerebral hemisphere is atrophied, the cavity which is present at the inner part of the cerebral hemisphere will be dilated. Okay, so this condition is known as normal pressure hydrocephalus. So some of the features of Parkinsonism may be present. May be present. Okay, dementia may be there, uh, you know, as a result of atrophy of the brain, and some other features may also be there. Cardioembolic stroke. Now, another important cause of dementia in the older people is okay, uh, this cardioembolic stroke. Repeated 
small types of embolic obstruction of the blood vessels of the brain can give rise to dementia so this is the second of most common cause of dementia all over the world after alzheimer disease that's why it is considered as a differential diagnosis here essential tremor i already talked about the type of tremor here is a different one it may not occur exactly in the resting phase and the tremor is not as uh, you know typical as the a parkinson disease tremor like a pill rolling movement is not seen in essential tremor it's a fine fine type of tremor there and it may run in the family we do exactly do not know what is the cause there creutzfeldt jakob disease or jakob creutzfeldt disease are is known as prion disease so let me explain a little bit about here okay prion disease this prion are known as infectious protein and this may this is known as a transmissible disease okay transmissible spongiform disease now there are multiple uh, you know causes of jakob creutzfeldt disease one of the cause may be genetic it may be a you know genetic inheritance probably caused by uh, you know a mutation okay that is one another may be idiopathic you do not know the cause there and third one may be it is also known as mad cow disease mad cow disease of some some type of you know cow uh, if a beef is uh, eaten okay from those uh, cow then probably this type of disease may occur in some of the textbook it is uh, highlighted like that and one more common cause these days is because of the transplantation of the tissue which are already having this uh, you know abnormal type of protein transplantation of some of the tissue one of the important tissue which is transplanted these days is cornea okay corneal transplantation so that may be associated with this type of prion diseases now what happens to the patient this patient will have serious damage of the brain this is known as spongiform encephalopathy spongy form encephalopathy and over a period of time the person will have memory loss or dementia the person may be incapacitated he cannot do anything uh, probably may be bedridden and may develop coma as well very difficult condition to treat now lastly there are some drugs which can induce parkinsonism like feature and these drugs are neuroleptics and antiemetic give me some of the example of neuroleptic drug which can cause parkinsonism like feature yes haloperidol haloperidol promethazine prochlorperazine good okay chlorpromazine good so some of the answers i already got the important examples of neuroleptics are chlorpromazine haloperidol okay Clopromazine, haloperidol, flufenazine. These are the different type of drugs. Just few of the name would be enough. Clopromazine is called prototype neuroleptic drug. Neuroleptics means these are the drug which are used in the treatment of psychotic disorder. So they are also known as antipsychotic drug, like schizophrenia. We we use neuroleptics for the treatment. Okay. so one of the important side effect of those neuroleptics is parkinsonism like feature so what they do there they block the dopamine receptor so that acetylcholine or cholinergic receptor will take the upper hand so uh, parkinsonism like feature will result now antiemetic which antiemetic here cocolamine but metoclopramide metoclopramide peridone exactly exactly metoclopramide and domperidone are those antiemetics especially metoclopramide which may result in parkinsonism like feature never forget this and remember this metoclopramide is very commonly given in a person who is vomiting most of the time after uh, gastroenteritis or diarrhea and vomiting people used to prescribe that and sometimes a child okay would be given a lot of dose a bit of more dose of uh, chlorpropamide and that child was brought to the hospital 
and when you examine you know the child is having rigidity okay the child may be having rigidity of the limbs the child may be having abnormal movements out around the face area and if you take a good history you can identify or diagnose this condition this is because of uh, that metoclopramide which is given in a more dose than required to the child another drug which is known as anti hypertensive drug but this is not commonly used anti hypertensive drug at all that is called reserpine this reserpine is depleting the intraneuronal dopamine store so to manage this type of parkinsonism we can either discontinue these drugs which are causing it or we can give some other drugs which will balance the things up okay these are anticholinergic drug because the pathogenesis is cholinergic uh, you know activity is uh, a bit upper than above than normal here so if we block those cholinergic activity then there will be a good balance okay so we'll talk about that during the management let's move on now what are the different lab work up we can order or we can go for in case of parkinson disease i already told you parkinson disease is the clinical diagnosis so lab work up are not very important for the disease per se but to rule out the differential diagnosis you can go for certain lab test this is the excellent way of answering one of the test which we do is serum ceruloplasmin concentration or serum ceruloplasmin level and you every student know this test is done for the diagnosis of wilson disease wilson disease is the copper overload condition okay and in wilson disease there is damage of the extra pyramidal system of the brain so some of the clinical feature may be you know similar to the parkinson disease especially if that patient is a younger patient younger than 40 years then wilson disease has to be thought okay and remember some parkinson disease uh, can also occur in the younger age especially if the, if the genetic type of parkinson disease there okay so it is not a bad idea to send this patient for serum ceruloplasmin level and uh, evaluation of kf ring what is the full form of kf ring kaiser kaiser fleischer rings excellent kaiser fleischer ring very good kaiser fleischer ring is one of the important finding of wilson disease it is present around the cornea around the cornea of the eye and uh, we can also go for urinary copper measurement urinary copper measurement now what is the role of mri and ct scan in the diagnosis of parkinson disease if we ask that question to the students okay and the answer is there is not much finding there so we do not usually go for this type of test for the confirmation of parkinson disease per se but to rule out some other similar looking condition you know you can go for this even if you go for nobody would say anything you can safely give the explanation or reason there yes i can rule out the differential diagnosis by doing mri or ct so no imaging study is required in patient with the typical presentation mri is useful to exclude multi infarct state hydrocephalus and the lesion of wilson disease so these are all differential diagnosis and mri should be obtained in patient who lack tremor have an acute progression or are younger than 55 years again to rule out the differential diagnosis now after going through these uh, different things let's talk about what is the treatment if any question comes from this topic we love to ask about the clinical feature and treatment okay so please pay attention here regarding the goal of medical management of parkinson disease okay the goal is it it uh, the medicines are provided to control the signs and symptoms this disease is very difficult to completely cure so 
we should control the signs and symptoms of this condition and a lot of these medicines are having adverse effect or side effect so we will try to minimize the side effect as well medications usually provide good symptomatic control of motor signs for four to six years and after that they start to cause some serious side effects some serious side effects one of that is called tardive dyskinesia tardive dyskinesia okay some abnormal uh, you know a contraction a spasm around the facial muscles and that cannot be even avoided sometimes disability progresses despite the best medical management and many patients develop long term motor complication like fluctuation and dyskinesia that's what i, I talked just now tardive dyskinesia okay is one of the condition which occurs around the face and this is a important uh, side effect or adverse effect of medicine the dopamine which we usually give or levodopa i should say and fluctuation means on and off effect the same medicine were uh, producing a good result in the patient but after few years the same type of medicines are not causing or producing the similar reaction or similar effect this is known as fluctuation additional causes of disability in late disease include postural instability which may occur after many years we already talked about that and dementia it also takes time okay uh, uh, to be present in the patient because it's a neurodegenerative disorder many cerebral neurons has to be damaged then only dementia can occur now what is the you know uh, message uh, from this uh, slide the message is this disease is difficult to treat number one we have got many medicines yes completely agreed but having those different medicines it is not certain that the treatment will be smooth after certain years or few years the person will develop different adverse effect and fluctuation as well let's move on now what are those drugs or medicine so all of you please focus on your screen and look at the name of those medicine please have a look there so these are the drugs which influence brain dopaminergic system and they are dopamine precursor like levodopa very important drug levodopa probably uh, this is the drug of choice in the treatment of parkinson disease we can go for dopamine agonist like bromocriptine pargolide pramipexol and ropinirol okay you don't need to remember all of these drug just two of them may be enough bromocriptine and pargolide are the easy name to remember they are called dopamine agonist so which type of drugs are called agonist or what do you mean by agonist drug we stimulate the receptors of dopamine these are the analogs very good very good they are the analog okay they are the synthetic analog and they stimulate the same receptor where dopamine is acting wonderful okay they they produce the similar type of effect now this drug bromocriptine you have heard the name of this drug so many times before bromocriptine can you tell me any other use of bromocriptine yes prolactinemia Okay, so why why we use bromocriptine there? Sir, because of the prolactin, sir, it increases. So this will affect the prolactin gland, sir. So you are right, actually. So this drug may be used in the treatment of hyperprolactinemia, uh, which results in galactoria. Remember the uh, you know a relation of dopamine with prolactin. So there lies your answer: dopamine and prolactin. dopamine okay it stops the secretion of prolactin is yes or no 
okay probably I, i'm not sure whether we have studied this or not but very soon we are going to talk about this when we enter into the endocrinology after neurology i'll enter there so bromocriptine okay is blocked by dopamine that's why the role of dopamine agonist see the dopamine agonist act almost like a dopamine so uh, bromocriptine is used in the treatment of hyperprolactinemia or galacturia this is the explanation let's move on dopamine releasing drug like amantadine uh, this amantadine is actually not the important drug here it is important drug in some other condition so what is that which type of drug is this antiviral very good antiviral very. influenza influenza infection very good this is antiviral or anti influenza drug excellent this is used in the treatment of influenza or flu which is caused by influenza virus amantadine but this drug because of its dopamine releasing property it can be used in the treatment of uh, you know parkinson disease mao b inhibitor monoamine oxidase b inhibitor these drugs are selazenil okay selazilin also known as deprinil and rasazilin selazilin or deprinil and rasazilin these are called mao b inhibitor this mao b or monoamine oxidase b is the enzyme which metabolize dopamine so if we block the metabolism of dopamine then this patient would benefit because this disease is all about decrease concentration of dopamine this is a good drug selazilin we'll talk about this another group of drugs are called comt inhibitor now see this comt inhibitor the full form are quite a catechol o methyl transferase inhibitor now they are tol capone and entacapone tol capone and entacapone they also metabolize dopamine means they break down dopamine so if we block this enzyme the dopamine cannot be metabolized easily or it takes a bit of time for the metabolism so these are helpful here and then one of the wonderful drug which we always okay mix with levodopa is called peripheral decarboxylase inhibitors these are carbidopa and benzerazide carbidopa and benzerazide carbidopa is very commonly used we combine levodopa with carbidopa because this carbidopa is blocking decarboxylase enzyme which is you know uh, again metabolizing that levodopa which we give to the patient we'll talk about this mechanism extensively let me list the drug first okay now other group of drugs look at the list other groups of drugs are called drugs which influence brain cholinergic system they are centrally acting anticholinergic drug and antihistamine drug now one question will be commonly asked to you what's the role of this drug in the treatment of uh, parkinsonism like feature or parkinson disease remember that pathophysiology there is imbalance between dopaminergic neuron and cholinergic neuron here cholinergic neurons are having upper hand so if we block this cholinergic system by using anticholinergic drug or by having this antihistamine they also block the cholinergic system it will help it it will balance the thing up there is good balance between dopamine and cholinergic system again so patient will be benefited and these drugs are benzotropin benzhexol also known as trihexyphenidyl procyclidin and bipyridine benzotropin benzhexol also known as trihexyphenidyl procyclidin and bipyridine please memorize these anyhow okay repeat this with these many times because these are very common question asked in mcq exam other drugs are h1 receptor blocker or classically they are known as antihistamine drug which have anticholinergic property like promethazine diphenhydramine and orphenadrine promethazine 
diphenhydramine and orphenhydramine, especially those, uh, you know, uh, sedative type of H1 receptor blocker usually have anticholinergic property. The non-sedative type of drugs, they do not have anticholinergic property usually. Let's move on. Now, all of you, please focus on this slide. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds time to see this. See that, please? Now, one question I like to ask here, okay? You have already seen this, I'm sure about it. Some of the students definitely. Why carbidopa is given along with libidopa? Who can answer this? Sir, uh, carbidopa <coughs> is because blocking the enzyme. Blo blocking the period. Because it, is, because it, it cannot uh, cross the barrier. It does not cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, it okay. does not allow the levodopa to change. It will let the levodopa to cross the bill. Okay, good, good. Let me ask you turn by turn, okay? Because we, many students are, uh, I can clearly listen to Mujib, but not other students. Yes, Rana Atisam, I'll give this uh, chance to you. Can you explain? Uh, sir, uh, carbidopa prevent the levodopa. Okay. Okay. I cannot hear him properly. So, Uzer, yes, Uzer, you are saying something? Sir, it does not cross the blood brain barrier, long call. Okay. Yes, Sunny, Sohel, I can see. Uh, sir, it will block the. Yes, yes. It will. Sir, sir, it will block block the enzyme in the periphery so levodopa will be able to cross blood brain barrier in the presence of carbidopa okay okay now i'm sure many of the other students can also explain in the same way okay the answer is very easy just have a concept of this very very important question in the exam okay so let me explain this now okay all of you please mute yourself let me explain when we give carbidopa along with libidopa. Now see the effect of this carbidopa. Carbidopa is dopa decarboxylase or peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor. This dopa decarboxylase is also known as aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, AAAD. Okay, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Another term is dopa decarboxylase or peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor, okay? This, this, this particular drug. It will block this enzyme definitely so that levodopa cannot be converted into dopamine. This is the main purpose of giving carbidopa and this carbidopa itself cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So whatever effect this carbidopa is showing, it is in the peripheral tissue and that's what we want. If we do not give this carbidopa, what will happen to this levodopa? See there, levodopa can quickly metabolize to dopamine and this dopamine itself cannot cross the blood-brain barrier now. So what's the use of giving this drug? We want this dopamine inside the central nervous system in the substantia nigra. If the drug cannot reach there, what's the use of giving this drug for the treatment? Okay, that's why if we combine carbidopa with libidopa, carbidopa will block that particular enzyme. So libidopa remains as libidopa. This libidopa will easily cross the blood-brain barrier and it reaches the central nervous system. 
see this it reaches the central nervous system is here now now inside the central nervous system the same enzyme is present again and it is converted into dopamine and this dopamine is utilized now because there is a lack of dopamine in parkinson disease at the same time if we give tol capone or anta capone this type of drug just see the effect of this drug here tol capone and anta capone they are inhibiting catechol o methyl transferase enzyme okay so that this levodopa okay remains as such it is not metabolized into 3o methyl dopa there is more concentration of levodopa remains and more amount can enter into the central nervous system so we can safely combine tol capone with this levodopa as well the similar type of effect can be seen inside the central nervous system also so let me uh, repeat once again carbidopa is a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor so this carbidopa will not allow levodopa to convert into dopamine in the peripheral system dopamine okay cannot cross the blood brain barrier so if levodopa converts into dopamine it's a useless thing that's why we want levodopa to remain as levodopa in the periphery levodopa can easily cross the blood brain barrier and enter into the brain inside the brain the same enzyme will convert it into dopamine and it is utilized i'm sure it it explains nicely now let's move on now what's the use of selegiline this selegiline is known as neuroprotective therapy okay neuroprotective therapy why let's talk about it it is mainly a mao b inhibitor and mao b is the enzyme which is metabolizing dopamine the lab investigation continue to provide evidence that selegilin affords a neuroprotective effect for dopamine neuron means it doesn't allow those dopaminergic neuron to disintegrate or die easily selegilin has been demonstrated to protect the culture dopamine neuron from mpp toxicity also so this mpp plus is a oxidized from a form of mptp which is a type of neurotoxin there and this is listed as one of the cause of parkinson disease that's why it is known as a neuroprotective agent this selegiline okay the function of this selegiline is mediated by new protein synthesis inside this neuron this induces a increased synthesis of antioxidant and anti apoptotic protein that's why it is known as neuroprotective agent and one of the metabolite known as dismethyl selegiline is the active agent for neuroprotection you, nobody is going to ask you everything regarding the mechanism of action of the selegiline just remember this sentence here selegiline is a neuroprotective therapy in case of parkinson disease and it is one of the important drug that much is enough now after selegiline okay let's talk about some other therapy levodopa always given along with peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor known as carbidopa this remains the standard of symptomatic treatment for parkinson disease this is known as drug of choice this combination is the drug of choice for the treatment of parkinson disease so most of the student will be asked this question in the exam in the viva okay why it is combined together and i just explained to you it provides the greatest anti parkinsonian benefit with the fewest adverse effect in the short term but if we use it for a long term the same drug may cause fluctuation and dyskinesia fluctuation means on and off effect and dyskinesia is a painful spasm occurring in the different part of the body especially around the face now some other group of drugs are dopamine agonist like bromocriptin pramipexol cabergolin okay pargolide these are the different example 
and they provide relatively smooth and sustained receptor stimulation because these are the agonist drug. These are the agonist drug. Now, some of the adverse effect or side effect of this agonist drug are more sedation, hallucination, edema, okay, and impulse control disorder. Impulse control disorder. Now, let me say a little bit about this. Most of the students know about hallucination. What is hallucination? Abnormalities of perception, sir. Oh, very good. Excellent way, Sadat and Rana Atisham. Very good. That is a very, very good way of answering. This is abnormal perception, okay, of the stimuli. There's different types. Visual hallucination, auditory hallucination, tactile hallucination, gustatory hallucination, different types are there. Okay, this is hallucination, one of the very important feature of psychiatric disorders. Now, just correlate this, okay, with the psychiatric disorder called schizophrenia here. In schizophrenia, okay, there is excessive concentration of dopamine. That's why the problem occurs. In this situation, you are stimulating those dopamine receptor. So a little bit similar type of situation, you know, in both condition, there is overactivity of dopaminergic system, which uh, may be causing hallucination. So see that, I'm just explaining you how to remember these things, okay? So if you correlate the things, the uh, concept will be there. Impulse control disorder means the person cannot control the emotion the person cannot control that typical activity. This type of people, if they go to a shopping mall, okay, or some, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, shopping areas, they may steal the things. They cannot control themselves. They know that is not good to do, but they can still, uh, you know, steal the very small things. The person may be a billionaire or millionaire, but they, may still steal the things. These are called impulse control disorder. One more drug is called amantadine. So this is antiviral drug. Many students told it correctly, but in this situation, what is the effect? They enhance dopamine release. They inhibit dopamine reuptake and they stimulate postsynaptic dopamine receptor or the enhanced dopamine receptor sensitivity. All of this effect is beneficial for the patient with Parkinson's disease. We can use them as a monotherapy, means single drug, or we can give them together with levodopa on peripheral okay, decarboxylase inhibitor, PDI, also known as carbidopa or benzerazide. Amantadine, provide some benefit for tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. So this is one of the option, you know, one of the option for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Now, what about tolcapone and entacapone? This tolcapone and entacapone are called as inhibitor of catechol O methyl transferase, COMT. Now, how they help? help they increase the availability of levodopa, okay? So what they do by blocking that particular enzyme, they don't allow levodopa to metabolize. So they allow more concentration of levodopa there. And along with that, if we give carbidopa, then levodopa cannot be metabolized to dopamine also. So more concentration of levodopa will be there to enter into the brain. So you can safely use them along with levodopa and carbidopa. So these are the good drugs to remember, tolcapone and entacapone. Okay, now uh, let's talk about the surgical care or surgical treatment of Parkinson's disease. If medical treatment fails, if medical treatment uh, produces a lot of side effect or adverse effect, after a few years, you definitely need to go for surgical treatment. And one of the excellent type of surgical treatment is known as DBS or deep brain stimulation. 
So look at this picture. Okay. Uh, uh, after a few seconds, it will be discontinued, and I'll continue again after the break. But before that, let me explain a little bit about this. See here. Okay. So there is a source of uh, electrical activity here. That electrical activity will reach to the you know inside of the brain, the affected area of the brain, and it will stimulate those neurons for the better function. This is the principle of deep brain stimulation. Let's talk a little bit about the procedure, how they are going to do it. The deep brain stimulation system consists of a lead that is implanted into the targeted brain structure like thalamus, globus pallidus, and subthalamic nucleus. Isn't it? These are the affected area. These are the uh, parts of the extrapyramidal system. Please mute, mute yourself. Yes. Now, what happens? The lead is connected to an implantable pulse generator. This implantable pulse generator is the power source of the system, which is generally implanted in the chest cavity just below the clavicle. So it is kept there. That is a power source. And the tip of that wire, okay, a tip of that lead wire is. Uh, you know, kept into the uh, these are targeted brain structure like globus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus, or thalamus. Now, what what is the purpose here? It provides electrical stimulation to the targeted brain area. Okay, electrical stimulation to the targeted brain area, and we believe if those neurons are stimulated, there is more secretion of dopamine, and it may help the problem okay so these are uh, the principles of doing this type of therapy let me repeat again this is very commonly done all, all over the world in case of parkinson's disease these days now some other treatments are also available okay some other treatments are also available and these are called destructive type of surgery like thalamotomy and pallidotomy. Now, thalamotomy is a destruction of a part of the thalamus. Generally, the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus to relieve the tremor. Okay, because tremor is one of the a very important problem of Parkinson's disease. So that type of treatment can be done in case of serious condition. Thalamotomy has a little effect on bradykinesia, rigidity, the fluctuations in the motor symptoms. Or dyskinesia. It just uh, has an important effect on relieving of the tremor. Pallidotomy is a destruction of globus pallidus because of this uh, pallidus, okay, pallidotomy term has been given and it has a significant improvement in each of the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease like tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia as well as significant reduction in dyskinesia. So if we ask you this question, what is the better surgery between thalamotomy and pallidotomy? The answer is definitely pallidotomy. But having said that, these are destructive type of surgery. These are difficult to do and these are irreversible once we do it. So better to go for some reversible type of surgery like deep breath stimulation in the beginning. Now the last part, of the treatment, okay, which is a part of surgical uh, treatment, is transplantation of some of the cells in that affected area. Okay, this is called neural transplantation. This is a potential treatment, and this is a you know type of treatment which cures the disease, but it is still under the trial. It is still uh, you know under research. So, fetal nigral cells, sympathetic ganglia cell carotid body glomus cell and neuroblastoma cell. If we transplant these cells or tissues in the substantia nigra, then probably that will help the patient. But let me tell you again, uh, you know, this is uh, the, uh, you know, under the research still, it is not completely proven.